I've said I'm Wanda. I'm with the Southern Independent Booksellers Alliance, and we're so happy to welcome you here during these strange times. We're trying to bring authors directly to your living room or your kitchen or your bedroom or your backyard, wherever you might be. We hope that you'll support both the author and the bookstores by buying the book feature today. We are recording this and we'll share it when it is available. We want to welcome you to Reader Meet Writer, writer Okra Picks Edition featuring Lee Smith with her delightful novella, Blue Marlin. It is our goal to help readers, writers, and booksellers through these unprecedented times. We hope to provide some retail therapy, entertainment, and distraction all in the same hour. Please dance with the one that brung you. And if you want this book or any other book, order it from the store that invited you here. <laughs> Born in the small coal mining town of Grundy, Virginia, Lee Smith began writing stories at the age of nine and selling them for a nickel a piece. And that sounds like just about the greatest deal I have ever heard. Since then, she has written 17 works of fiction, including Fair and Tender Ladies, Oral History, and most recently, Guests on Earth. She has received many awards, including the North Carolina Award for Literature and an Academy Award in Fiction from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. Her novel, The Last Girls, was a New York Times bestseller, as well as winner of the Southern Book Critics Circle Award. She lives in Hillsboro, North Carolina with her husband, the writer, Hal Crowther. Hello, Lee. How are you today? Hello. Fine. It's nice to be here. Great. Thank you. Shall You're I welcome. just go ahead and start talking? All yeah, right. Tell us about well, Blue Marlin. Well, first, let me say it's a great honor to be here today. I'm very happy to be looking out at some of you and knowing that a lot of you are there because, you know, reading readers and writers need to get together and I think they particularly need to get together in these perilous unprecedented times that we're experiencing here in America and I just want to thank you so much for coming for coming in on this for caring about books um, it's a two-way street you know if you're a writer you got to have a reader it's a two-way thing and it's just a beautiful thing when it comes together and I think we owe Wanda a huge thanks here. Wanda Jewell, who has been the valiant leader, the head of SEBA for a really long time and is getting ready to retire. And I think we owe her all, you know, readers, bookstores, everybody owes Wanda a great big thank you. So let's do that first. Well, and then, you, yes, yay. yay. <laughs> all right. And then now I want to tell you about my new book. This is my new little book. Can you see it? Yes. The name of it is Blue Marlin. And that's the name of a kind of seedy motel in Key West, Florida, which you can stay in right now if you go down there. I've stayed there a lot. And uh, that's, the name, that's the name of this book. And although I've been writing fiction, I've been publishing fiction actually for 54 years. Uh, this little book in a certain way makes me happier than any other thing I've ever done because it's based on a true story and a, a true experience that happened to me and that I just love. And so I use that experience. Usually I write just flat out from, you know, from my head, but this story happened to me. This is what happened to me. And it was so unforgettable that I always wanted to put it in a story. So this is the story. Um, and get ready for a, get ready for a ride. Get ready for a real change of scene, which might not be a bad thing today uh, when you read this, because it's set in 1958. In starts in Virginia, and then it becomes a road trip to Key West. And here's the story: uh, When I was 13 in 1958, uh, both my parents were in. I was an only. And both my parents had been hospitalized for the better part of a year. Daddy at a mental hospital up in Silver Hill, Connecticut, and Mama for much the same kind of thing, what they then called a nervous breakdown at UVA's hospital in Charlottesville. So I had been farmed out to various relatives. And then came the time when we're all going to get together. But there seemed to be some 
problem with that, which they were not quite telling me. And daddy had a psychiatrist who was a very wise man and he prescribed two things for the family, the whole family, me and my daddy and mama. He prescribed some lithium for daddy and a geographical cure for the family. And the geographical cure was take a trip. You know, you've been in Grundy, Virginia all your life, take a trip. So daddy said, all right, we're gonna go to Key West because he'd been stationed in the Navy in Key West. In the, uh, he was in the Philippines, but he went in and out on his ship uh, from Key West. So we get in the car and go to Key West. It wasn't going too good when we started out. They were not really speaking. Huge fishtail Buick going down the Keys, full of cigarette smoke, right? There was smoking. They're not saying much except things like, like, Lee, would you please tell your father to stop for more cigarettes? <laughs> I mean, it's that kind of thing. So it wasn't going very well. Finally, after days of driving, we get to Key West. We pull into the Blue Marlin Motel. This is the real sign on the top of the Blue Marlin, uh, right off of Duval Street. Eddie goes in, checks in, and he comes out with this really weird look on his face. And he said, girls, I have to tell you something. And we said, well, what? And he said, well, we're the only actual real people who are staying in this hotel, as it turns out. And we said, what? And he said, yes. He said, everybody else is part of a film crew. The actors and the film crew, they're here making a movie in Key West. The movie was, in fact, Operation Petticoat, which some of y'all might have seen. Operation Petticoat is being made here, and we are the only actual real people, and I've had to promise them that you will not bother the stars, Lee, or create any problems for anyone. I said, oh, yes, yes, yes. But Mama and I were saying, what stars? Because my mother's the only person I ever knew who had an actual subscription to the National Enquirer. And we went, man, every time the movie changed in Grundy, we were there on the eighth row. So we were ready. We were so excited. And Daddy said, well, it's Tony Curtis, Cary Grant, Dina Merrill, and we just drowned him out. We said, Tony Curtis, Cary Grant, we're just going crazy. So Mama began to perk up, I mean, right there. And that was the start of it. And uh, we stayed there. We got to know everybody. We had a wonderful time. And uh, so a lot of things happened, which you'll learn about when you read this book. But one funny thing that happened every day that we've stayed in that motel, I, I wrote about it a little bit in, in the end. The in part, in part of this is kind of a little essay about the difference between fiction and life and writing fiction, the difference between writing fiction and nonfiction and some issues that come up and that kind of thing. But anyway, this is true. This is every night at 7 p.m. Mama and I seated ourselves on a rattan love seat in the lobby of the Blue Marlin, pretending to read newspapers, while we eavesdropped on Tony Curtis's daily call from the public telephone to Janet Lee back in Hollywood, which always ended with Tony's words, God bless you, my darling. We rattled their newspapers <laughs> emotionally. And this happened every single night. And obviously things began to perk up. So that, that's the basic story. That's why I've always treasured this trip and wanted to write about it. However, you know, you write fiction. Um, I've always felt that I could tell the truth about certain things better in fiction than in nonfiction. And so when you write fiction, you make some changes. While the trip is the same, the stars are the same, what happened is pretty much the same same once we get to Key West. The story is different because these parents are not my parents. Um, you kind of, you know, when you're writing fiction, you got to up the ante a little bit. So these parents are not my parents. They're a little bit more colorful. And, um, and this little narrator is not really me, although she's, she's kind of close because I also was an only child as Wanda pointed out in her introduction. So let me read a little section, a um, little character sketch of the narrator right here. Um, this is in Virginia before the family starts off on the geographical cure. But um, I, 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 even at that point, this little character, age 12, really wants to be a writer. And she also says, I had a secret career as a spy. And this was mainly what I did on my bike trips around town. 
I'd seen some really neat stuff too. For instance, I had seen Roger Ainsley, the coolest guy in our school, squeezing pimples in his bathroom mirror. I'd seen Mr. Bondurant whip his big son Earl with a belt a lot harder than anybody ever ought to. And later, when Earl dropped out of school and enlisted in the army, I felt that I alone knew why. I'd seen my fourth grade teacher, Prissy Miss Emily Horn, necking on the couch with her boyfriend and smoking cigarettes. Best of all, I had seen Mrs. Cecil Hertz come running past a picture window wearing nothing but an apron, followed shortly by Mr. Cecil Hertz himself wearing nothing at all and carrying a spatula. It was amazing how careless people are about drawing their drapes and pulling their shades down. It was amazing what you could see, especially if you were an athletic and enterprising girl, such as myself. I wrote my observations down in a Davy Crockett spiral notebook I bought for this purpose. I wrote down everything, date, time, weather, physical descriptions, my reaction. I would use this stuff later in my novels. And obviously I have. <laughs> but anyway, that's the kind of child, that's the kind of child child who's their narrator here. She's a lot more um, more inventive and, and fearless than I was actually in some of the things she gets into in Key West and some of the things she's thinking. But she is an only child and I was an only child. And um, this is a kind of situation that uh, only children often take the blame for. You know, when there's something wrong in the family, they sort of absorb the pain and take the blame. And she works out a sort of a magical thinking kind of thing that if she, well, anyway, she gets very involved in the whole thing. Um, all right, let me tell, let me, let me share a little bit about uh, Mama with you. Let's see, where is Mama? Here she is. Mama is a wonderful character. Um, the fact is, I was just too much for Mama, coming to them so late in life a surprise, she said, after my two older sisters had already sapped her strength and lowered her resistance, as she said, to all kinds of things, including migraine headaches, asthma, colitis, and a heart mama. These ailments required her to lie down a great deal of the time, but did not prevent her from being perfectly beautiful, as I was. My mother was widely known as one of the most beautiful women in Virginia. Everybody said so. Previously, she had been the most beautiful girl in Charleston, South Carolina, where she had grown up as Billy Rutledge and lived until she married my father, John Fitzhugh Dale Jr., a naval officer stationed there briefly during the war, just long enough to sweep me off my feet, as she put it. He was a divine dancer. And my most cherished image of my parents involved them waltzing grandly around a ballroom floor, she in a long white gown, he in a snappy uniform, her hair and the buttons on the uniform gleaming golden in the light from the sparkling chandeliers. Thus she became Billy Rutledge Dale in a ceremony I loved to imagine. It was a wedding of superlatives, the handsomest couple in the world, a wedding cake six feet high, a gown with a train 15 feet long, 10 bridesmaids, a horse and buggy, not to mention a former suicide, a former suitor's suicide attempt the night before while everybody else was dancing the night away. I was especially fascinated by this unsuccessful project, which involved a young man trying to hang himself from a coat rack in a downtown men's club after which he was forever referred to as Bobby Too Tall Burks. Some people said Mama looked like Marilyn Monroe, but I didn't think so. Mama was bigger, blonder, paler, softer, with a sort of inflatable celluloid prettiness. She looked like a great big baby doll. People also said I took after Mama, but this was not true either, at least not yet. And I didn't want it to become true, at least not entirely is a fear that taken after her too much might eventually damn me into lying down a lot of the time, which looked pretty boring. On the other hand, I was simply dying to get my period, grow breasts, turn into a sex pot, and do as much damage as mama. 
who had broken every heart in Charleston and had a charm bracelet made out of fraternity pins to prove it. She used to tick them off for me one by one. Now, that was Smith's Black, a Fidel from UVA, such a darling boy. And this one was Parker Winther for Sigma Chi at WNL. He used to play the ukulele. I was drunk on the sound of so many alphabetical syllables. <laughs> so that's mama. And um, daddy is um, less of a quote character character, but just a very, very interesting man. And in this, in this novel, um, he has had an affair. And so, which never happened in life to my knowledge, but uh, in this novel, that's what's happening. And she's, that's why the little girl is trying so hard through her, a kind of magical thinking to bring them, to bring them back together. And uh, you'll have to uh, just read the book, I think, to see what happens. Thank you so much. Yes, that was you're welcome. Wonderful. You're welcome. Wonderful. It's time for questions. It's important that y'all stay muted so we can all hear. So in the chat option, please begin all questions with a capital Q. And if you'd like, name your local store and we'll give them a shout out when we ask your question. Linda Marie, do we have a question for Lee Smith? We do. Um, Susan, a fan of novel in Memphis asks, did you know the story would be a novella when you started out or a short story or a novel? Can you tell us about um, the process with the story? I thought it, I was trying to write a short story and it just kept going. And there's a middle part of it that's really totally made up about the cousin she goes to live with while both parents are, you know, while both parents are, are gone and so on. And I, I got into that part. I wasn't expecting, I was, it was a total, it went long. And uh, it just turned out to be a novella length. And actually, I really like that like that length. I was, I, was, I was trying to write a shorter story, but it just took on a life of its own. And my experience has always been when something like that happens, you need to go with it. You know, you just, you need to, you need to let the story, let the story tell itself if, if it's trying to do that. So. Wonderful. Linda Marie, do we have another question? Another viewer asks, with a 13 year old protagonist, is this novel considered YA or appropriate for YA? Asking for my high school classroom. Um, I think it's probably not appropriate for YA. I don't know. I mean, I think uh, some of the, uh, my teenage, my, my young, young teenage protagonist here forms a big friendship with some strippers that are living up the street, you know, for the at the uh, at the cl at strip club and she takes them out takes some cigarettes every day and has a few drinks over there and just she does a lot of things in here in this book I mean nothing terrible but I think possibly I think uh, I think a number of 13 or 14 year olds might be able to read it but I think somebody might get on to the teacher if they if if it were assigned <laughs> that's what I think thank uh, you Linda Marie do we have another one mm -hmm. Yes, from a fan of Malaprop's bookstore in Asheville. Yay! Do you think the isolation we're in now is helpful for those who write or produce other art, a gift of time? You know, that's a very good question. And I think it, um, I think it depends a whole lot on the artist or the person. Um, for me, I have been really writing a lot been really writing a lot I um you know I spend spending I've been cooking a lot and gardening a lot and and I like to stay home and I have found myself able to suddenly write toward the ending it's another novel writing uh, and I've been stuck for a long time and suddenly I'm able to write it and I don't know if it's uncertainty of the times or something but there's a there's a huge energy that's that's going into it and I know several other people who are working well at this time but you know it just depends upon your temperament I mean I'm lucky enough to be able to do this and so many people are so threatened economically and in every other kind of way by what's happening to them right now I mean it's, it is a terrible terrible time I think uh you know for me this has been this has been a little a little rising uh, 
gift of time, I guess, right in the middle of all the horror that's happening to so many people. So. Uh, another uh, viewer who's a fan of Dickens books in Lynch, Lynchburg, Virginia asks, uh -huh. are you working on a new novel? What are you working on now? Well, that's what I'm working. This is what I'm. This is what I'm working on. It's a collection of novellas and stories, and all of them are about guess what? Older people, such as myself, and I've been having a ball. I gotta say, the name of it is Silver Alert. Do you know what a Silver Alert is? Okay, it's like an Amber Alert. It's with the. It's when a geese. Somebody's got him in the assisted living say or somewhere and. Um, and he gets the keys to his car, you know, or she gets the keys to her car and takes off on the highway. And then they put out, it's like Amber Alert. If it's gotcha. a young, young teenager, they say put out the signs over the highway. It says Silver Alert, Silver Alert. And it gives the make model of the car. I have to say, this is another, gonna be another Key West story. This is what I'm doing right now. Uh, that um, when we were coming home from Key West last year, my husband and I saw that silver alert. You know, we said, oh man, oh, geezers on the road. And then we looked at the, the, the Porsche Carrera car, Por silver blue, Porsche Carrera 2005. And we're thinking, hey, you know, all right, who is this guy? You know, and then we go 100 more miles, it's up again. He's still going. He's still on the road. We go 100 more miles, it's still going. So finally, we're starting saying, yeah, go. You know, we get really invested in this guy. And then we start making up a story about who he might be. You know, he's just gotten the keys. He's busted out of assisted living, et cetera, et cetera. And then we're thinking, well, who's with him? And then I think, oh, man, it is the manicure girl from assisted living. You know, it's the pedicure girl, you know, the Manny Petty girl. And so then it becomes a sort of a big story and we're tracking him all the way up the keys and that we're not going. And we think they're headed for, for uh, Disney World. So, you know, that's the story. That's what I'm, wor that's what I'm that working on. Wonderful. And I just got to, somehow I had to, I've just had the time now. So it's fun. Um, it's fun to think about, um, road trips you know the road the, the, you know somebody once said there are only two plots in uh writing fiction in fiction and one plot is somebody takes a trip and the other plot is a stranger comes to town <laughs> you think about it you can kind of reduce most you know most novels or stories down to that hey linda marie do we have another question Another viewer asks or says, I first heard of you back in the early 80s as a student of Emory and Henry College in Southwest Virginia. At some point later, I saw you read parts of one of your novels in a bookstore. How has your writing voice changed over the years and is writing easier or harder now? Um, well, let me say that um, where she's talking about that bookstore in that area, that whole area of Southwest Virginia is where I grew up in Grundy, Virginia. And um, much of my earlier work, I'm, I'm a writer whose work is so related to place, whatever the place may be. And um, my earlier work really came from the mountains. It came from my childhood. It came from all the people in my family who were such great talkers, big talkers, storytellers. It came from the place itself and particularly all the older women that I had known who had told me stories that were so wonderful. So those are my earlier novels like Fair and Tender Ladies and Oral History and so on. I was just trying to use this incredible material which I had just been so privy to. And again, particularly maybe as an only child because I was always with, around the adults. You know, that's what only children get to do. And uh, so anyway, I was, you know, especially trying to give a voice to the older women that I had known growing up and to the people that I knew there. And for my, um, those, those two books in particular, Devil's Dream, which is about country music, mountain music, uh, those, those three books I think were my mountain books and, and they really came from there. Um, but then, you know, you get, you get married, you have kids, you get jobs, you have, you move somewhere else. And, um, so I think 
I haven't written now. I mean, this is now the province of Ron Rash and Silas House and all these wonderful writers that we have who are Appalachian writers who are still in the, you know, in the region. And I'm just soaking up everything they can read. But I do find myself very much somebody who takes in whatever's happening to me on my average day and where I live, which is like silver alert or um, something somebody just said to me in Whole Foods the other day, or just whatever it might be. And so now the places, whatever place I'm in, it, it prints heavy. And uh, this is kind of where I am. This is where I am now. I spent a lot of time in Key West just teaching down there and so on. And so, you know, that's uh, that's another place. But, but place is always important. That's great. Let's keep going, Linda Marie. We have time and we have questions. Okay, we have so okay. many questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. call, someone you know, Terry from Hollands, wanted to ask about the role of madness in your fiction. She says, I loved your novel about Zelda Fitzgerald, which was set Thank in- Thank you. And um, of course, Black Mountain Breakdown. Can you talk about that? Well, yes, I alluded a little bit, I think, uh, with this with this novel i said that the reason for the the reason for the geographical cure for the trip was because both parents had been uh had been in mental hospitals at the same time usually they weren't i mean usually be one would be in or one would be out or and i had a huge whole family that would you know would take care of everything while they were but there was a lot of that um in my family it's something that i did grow up with it was a factor and uh, I was also, of course, really interested in it, really involved in it. And somebody like Zelda Fitzgerald, that's why I wrote the book about, you know, about Zelda. I mean, because I was so fascinated with her. And it's something that has come into, you know, it has come into my work. Um, I'm actually a person, I think, who... Uh, does put a lot of herself into her work. I hear myself right now. This, this is what I'm saying. I mean, I, you think, you know, that's what you do when you're writing I mean, stuff up and you are, but the person who's writing it is you, you know, so you do. I mean, I think I'm writing about Zelda Fitzgerald or I think I'm writing about this or that, but you're the one that's writing it. And so these are, these are concerns. I uh, had a beloved son, Josh, who was schizophrenic and died at 34. And I have been very much an advocate for mental health and for um, non-stigmatizing, for talking about it, writing about it, getting it all out there, telling these stories. And so it's been something that I have been very active in and still am very active in, in terms of housing for people when they get out of the hospital and, and all that kind of thing. So it's, it's a cause that I really believe in. Um, another, yeah. another fan of Malaprops asks, do you think it's easier to tell the truth in fiction and not nonfiction? Oh yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Because people are so inconvenient. They don't, you know, real people. I mean, they don't, their stories don't necessarily have a shape that's a satisfying aesthetic shape you know, a beginning and a middle and an end, that is very, that's the oldest form of telling that storytelling. That's very satisfying. But in real life, a lot of times it's not because if somebody just gets stuck in the middle, there's no end ever to what's happening. I mean, it's just, you know, so it, it is very, uh, very good to be able to, to change it and, and, and make it conform, I think. Another question that's a very writerly question, do you work on multiple manuscripts at the same time? And if so, how do you balance that? And if not, how do you hang on to the energy of the stories you haven't yet finished? Um, this is always a balancing act too, and it's very hard. Um, I cannot be writing, fiction takes everything I've got. When I'm writing fiction, it takes, you know, it takes your whole heart, it takes your brain, it takes your, Attention, it just takes everything. So I really cannot be writing two pieces of fiction that I'm caring a whole lot about, two different ones at the same time. I know other people who do this routinely. I, one of my best friends 
is Jill McCorkle, another writer here in Hillsboro, and she works on multiple manuscripts, and sometimes she'll work on a story over years while she's writing a novel or writing something else, and she'll go back to it, and that just seems to me like a really good way to operate, <laughs> but I, can't, I just can't do it. I just have to do sort of one thing at one time. I can do, I can be doing fiction, like a novel, and be writing some short nonfiction pieces those things don't get in the way of each other. Somehow, as I think of it, it's a completely different kind of activity. I'm not quite sure why, but. Another viewer asks, what's the best thing you've read lately? What's the best thing I've read lately? Uh, hmm. I think one of the best things I've read lately is, uh, and I'll say, I'll mention it just because in particular, because I was looking at it because of this book set in Key West um, is Silas House's novel Southernmost. I think that's really one of the very best books I have ever read, period. And it's a fairly recent book. And it also is a road trip. It is a road trip of somebody heading to having abducted a child, his own child, and, and hitting the road for Key West. So that is wonderful. And then I also uh, read um, the Jojo Moyes book about the Kentucky librarians on horseback. Yes, yes. And I love that. And I'm so mad because I always wanted to write that book because I knew about them. You know, I knew about the librarians on horseback that went through the hills of Kentucky near Hindman, Kentucky, for instance, where I have taught often at the Hindman Settlement School, the writing thing in the summer. And I always wanted to write that. And damn, she did it. She did a real good job, too. And she's not even from there. She did a good job. <laughs> so those are two very recent recent reads. But um, I read a lot of, uh, just a lot of uh, different things. Do you have any advice when encouraging young adults to write as a way to preserve their life and history? Oh, I really do. And, and actually, I have to say, uh, during all the years that I taught, I taught many, many, many years in uh, junior high and high school. And that's just one of my favorite ages and one of my favorite kind of writing workshops or, or young writers to work with. And I think, like I was just urging, actually yesterday, a, a young 15-year-old girl that I know, I said, you should be writing now. I mean, right now, right in the middle of what we're going through, this is, this is history, you know, this is your history, and you are right here, and the way you're feeling is obviously intense, and what you're seeing, and listening, and doing, and thinking is, and you will never be here again, and you will be so glad that you have this, you know, if you will just go ahead and write, and I was then writing a note, the very same thing to my um, teenage granddaughter who's in Nashville, you know, write this down. This is you. This is so important. This is happening to you. And I think that is also serves a, a wonderful function, a kind of validation. And once you write it, put it out on the page, you can kind of deal with it a little bit better. You know what I mean? It's, it's there. It's on the page. It's, you know, no, it, it's less threatening, I think, if you can write it down. I have always felt writing to be a very therapeutic activity, always. And I think I haven't written so much for therapy. Uh, I've just written, but it is therapeutic. And sometimes I just write write down because I, there's something that I'm worried about and I just want to get it out on paper so I can look at it where I can see things that I can't see if it stays in my head. So, I'm, you know, I'm a writer who does that kind of thing. After my son Josh died, I was wrecked just a complete wreck. And I went to the psychiatrist and I was, had been trying to write a novel. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't even find my way to North Carolina State where I was a teacher. I was just a complete wreck. And um, he said, all right, I've got a prescription for you. Because I was wearing everybody out. I was such a wreck. And he said, I've got a prescription for you. And I said, and I'm hoping it was more drugs. You know, I'm ready for drugs. And he said, and he wrote on his little prescription pad and he handed it to me. And it said, write fiction every day. That was his prescription. And I said, what? I said, you know, I can't write. I can't write. I can't even sit down. I can't do anything. I was just like this. I said, I can't do anything. And he said, that's my prescription. He said, sit down, sit in the chair. 
you know, just sitting there, sit in the chair, sit in the chair every day for an hour with your, with your pencil and your pen and just do that. And so I did it. And actually on about the fifth day, I started, I started back on this novel that I had abandoned and um, it was, it got me through, you know, it really got me through. I mean, putting words in any kind of order on a page gives you, gives you an order in your head that you don't have. It's very, very helpful. So I did it. I followed my prescription and I, I think it's one I would pass along to anyone in, in any kind of a, of a crisis or situation. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are in one right now. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Yes. Um, Linda Marie, we have time for one more question, but before you choose the final question, Lee, I want to ask you if we send yes. you all of the questions that did not get answered, yes. would you be willing to write answers for us and we'll put them in our Lady Banks newsletter? Absolutely. Sure. Okay. So we're yeah. going to send you yeah. the questions that did not get answered. Right. I would be really interested in that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. So we're going to send those to you and then we'll publish them in the right. Lady Banks newsletter. Okay. Um, and if Wonderful. you don't subscribe, you can subscribe to that at ladybanks.com, I think. Is that right, Nikki? Ladybankscommonplacebook.com. I'm sorry, ladybankscommonplacebook.com. Okay. Okay, one more question, Linda Marie. Okay, because fair and tender ladies came up so many times, um, I'll ask this question. Ivy Rowe has such a wonderful voice. Did you draw from people you knew to create her? Absolutely. Yeah, that was that book meant so much to me because that was the first thing that I been um, taping for years. The older people in my family, like my Aunt Kate, who lived to be 107 and just all these people. And so I drew on, you know, I drew on them all. But it was uh, the older women in my family and then just women like Ava McClanahan, whom I had known and known all my life. And that's where I got that voice. And that's where I got, that's where she, that's where she came from. So I do a lot of research and taping and investigating, you know, before I actually start writing. So, yeah. And it meant so much to me to have, to have that, to have that, that memory and those memories and those voices. Cause I love those voices. That's, that's how I went to sleep, you know, here in, on a porch in somebody's lap hearing stories and those were you know those were the voices that was the accent so. that's beautiful thank you i got a private message here and um i'm gonna do this but that doesn't mean i'm never gonna do it again this thursday so that's the day after tomorrow is holland's giving day and Holland is where Lee went to college, along with a bunch of people here, yes. I think. And all gifts will be matched up to $100,000. So they want me to encourage Holland's folks to give at holland.edu slash day of giving 2020. So there you go, Emily T. I did it for you. All right. I'll do it. I'll give. <laughs> Please give it. Thank Absolutely. you, Lee. And thank you, everyone. This was wonderful. And if you enjoyed it as much as I did, let your bookstore know. Order the book from them. We hope to be scheduling scores of authors, so please be in touch with your bookstore with any suggestions or ideas for how this could have been better for you. And order Blue Marlin from them. Thanks to my tea, team, Linda Marie, SP, and Nikki, and a great big thank you again to Lee Smith for writing such a wonderful story. I'm happy to be here. Happy to be here. Y'all take care. <laughs> yeah. Okay. This is okay. Wanda signing off. Love you. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye.